So uh, what are the immediate implications of that? Number one, um, maybe there's a real assassination group that uh, they're trying to scare me. And if I back out, then they'll come out in the headlines and say, he got scared about the assassins. If I insist in coming home and I get shot, then they can always say, now look, we told you, it was an assassination plot. And you insisted, so don't blame us. I am going back to the Philippines, and if I have to go back to jail, so be it. I've always said that Mr. Marcos is the original terrorist. He is right now employing state violence. If we use violence against him, he will only justify the use of more violence against us. And since he's a more violent man, he has more forces of repression, we will be the loser. Because if you're not violent, then before the bar of public opinion and before God, he's the only sinner. I have uh, proclaimed martial law in accordance with the powers vested in the president by the Constitution of the Philippines. On that day, democracy died. I grew up in New Manila. Every afternoon, I would bike kasama ng mga street boys until dinner time. Palagi akong nakabuntot kay Papa. He was always attending to the needs of the people. I knew then I wanted to be in public service like him. You know, he lost his father when he was 15, so he felt he had to do something on his own to show that, um, I suppose that because he loved his father very much, and he wanted people to know that he took a lot after his father and that he was willing to risk many things. He was blessed with um, many talents. He wasn't a student in the real sense of the word. I mean, he, he, um, he read, but he did not read probably the books that were meant to be read in school. When I was 17, I joined the Manila Times. My job was to run errands for the newsmen. I'd pick up and deliver copies for them. I read and read and read what they wrote and learned to write on my own. Soon, they needed somebody to cover the Korean War. Siyempre, nagpresinta ako. I hop on the next military plane for Korea. Ninoy took risks <laughs> while well, starting, I guess, when he went to Korea, when he was only 17. There was a great danger that he could be killed there or, or injured, but um, he wanted to do something, something different, something unusual for a 17-year-old. President Ramon Magsaysay, who I met during my days at Manila Times, asked me to broker the surrender of communist leader Luis Taruk. Taruk has been fighting the government for like 20 years. I acted on it immediately, and I was able to negotiate his surrender. We never applied for a political asylum. And, um, you know, he always told me, uh, this is something very temporary, and eventually I'll have to go home. Ninoy said, um, if I don't go now, I will ask myself later on. 
I could have done something and I did not do anything and I will blame myself forever. The night before he left, I really couldn't sleep. And uh, it was August, he left August 13th, so August 12th. And August is a summer month, but in Boston, sometimes it gets cool. And so I I can't sleep and I have chills. And so I'm really worried. So I'm, Corey, we've talked about this for a long time. I know, and it's just that I wanted you to know how I feel. Before he left, sabi ko, Nina, can you tell me uh, what possible scenarios there will be? I said, well, uh, siguro when I get there, they'll arrest me and bring me to Fort Bonifacio again. Or uh, because I have had a triple bypass, baka na madali na ako sa heart center. Or then again, they might uh, put me under house arrest. And um, then... They could also, um, well, uh, parang, the last thing he said was, but if they make a mistake and they have me killed, then that's the best thing that will happen to me. Tapos ako, ninoy naman, don't talk like, no, no, something like because I've always wanted to die for our country. It is only instinctive for a man to look for his peace. And I debated with my mind, and I debated with myself, and I debated with my wife and my children whether I should go back to the arena of combat. I felt that I already earned my peace. I have done my best. I waited for seven years and seven months and the Filipino people did not react and they would even give me the impression that they love their chain and their slavery. What can one man do if the Filipino people love their slavery? If the Filipino people have lost their voice and would not say no to a tyrant, what can one man do? I have no army, I have no following, I have no money. I only have my indomitable spirit. Much as my family would have wanted to go home with me, I had to tell them no. Masyadong delicado. It will draw too much attention. Cory would have been the perfect travel partner, of course, but not under this circumstance. Ours was not a perfect marriage, of course, but I believe that he brought out the best in me, and I think I brought out the best in him. Because Nenoy and I were one. Could rely on each other that no matter what happened he'd be there for me and I'd be there for him but 12 hours into the trip I miss her terribly everything just went according to Ninoy's plans he ran for mayor when he was not with even 23, which was the required age for running for a town mayor. He also loved people. He was such an extrovert. I was never for him going to politics, but he believed that was what it was meant to do, and so uh, I was there to support him. He enjoyed being a politician. He enjoyed the crowds, he enjoyed giving speeches. 
And the people just loved him uh, when he gave those speeches. Ninoy Aquino has confirmed that one of the youngest. Nung tumakbo ko sa Senado, ibang labanan, I had to reach out to the whole nation. I even used a chopper to make grand entrances. Kailangan talagang magimik. It seemed to me that there was nothing that Ninoy could not handle. He had everything go his way and that uh, he had been able to plan his life and things were really going on schedule. I told him one day, you know, you're able to leave at 3 o'clock in the morning to fly to Manon to be a sponsor at the wedding and you cannot attend your sons or your daughters, uh, whatever. When you know, I was in politics, he had no time. Everything was just related to how he can first be nominated and how he can become president. The big event that uh, he was waiting for was the presidential elections in 1973. But, lo and behold, uh, I guess God had other plans. He has created an atmosphere that breeds communism. He has done more harm to himself and to the country by doing this. Minoy felt that um, there should be a third alternative. Um, Marcos used to say, if you don't choose me, this country will go to the communists. What did Mr. Marcos do? If you read his pronouncement, he said there was anarchy in the street, there was a left and right rebellion, there was this and there was that. But there is only one reason which he never said. He wanted to prolong his stay in Malacanang sapagkat napakasarap. Marcos has now full control of the whole country as he has assembled all the men. Running for a third term, don't you think that two terms is enough for any man? Very quietly, Mr. Marcos started maneuvering to change our form of government from an American-type presidential system to a British-type parliamentary so that he can be elected as a deputy for Milocos, become prime minister, and then stay on forever. That was the plan. You have witnessed the event of the last year. We have fallen and we are falling back on our last line of defense. We are also witnesses to the patience that we have shown in the face of provocation. In the face of abuse and license, we have used or attempted to use persuasion. Now, the limit has been reached for we are against the wall. We must now Defend the Republic of the Philippines with this stronger power. What is the cause for all of this struggle? Very succinctly, I believe that no man, how brilliant this man, can dictate the welfare or the direction of 48 million Filipinos. I vowed to myself that because you have elected me to the Senate, and I gloried in its pomp. Therefore, it is now time that I must suffer the consequences of my act. Marcos checked in at the kidney center. Yes. They did a test. 
he flunked all tests and the conclusion was if they operate on him it would be fatal. Uh -huh. So he went back to the palace, he's no longer responding to medication and he will have to be hooked up to the dialysis machine now more often. Uh -huh. How he will last with the machine on I don't know. Mm -hmm. they, apparently they are now moving to put in Imelda. In effective control. Yeah. But it's a matter of time, so he wanted three weeks to collect his thoughts, write his memoir, complete his book, and most probably uh, craft the final stages of his uh, administration. Mm -hmm. He's a man now, uh, terminal, he knows he's going, and uh, that's the background uh, that I'm coming in. Any indication from the U.S. side that there might be a somewhat helpful or cooperative or no. absolutely nothing? No indication, except that they're watching me. Of course. They're uh, following all my steps. God be with you. Thank you. Enjoy, huh? Bye-bye. My next stopover was Malaysia. I was invited by the Sultan of Johor, who was a close friend of mine. His son picked me up from Singapore, and I was brought across the border to Malaysia. I shared my plans with the Sultan and to some of his friends and allies who joined our meeting. He offered the southern back door to get me to the Philippines. I thank him for the offer, but my plan was already in place to land in Manila. I've ordered the arrest of those directly involved in the conspiracy to overthrow our duly constituted government by violence and subversion. Ninoy had been arrested early morning of uh, September 23, 1972, while they were having uh, a meeting in uh, the Hilton at the time. He called me on his radio phone, there were no cell phones at the time. And he said, Kori uh, pupunta ngayon ako sa Krami. And I said, bakit? At saka mo na malalaman. Mr. Marcos arrested together with us in the Senate, most of the leaders in the Constitution Convention. All of those opposing him went to jail with us. It was really just so awful and I thought, oh, this is just the beginning and what's going to happen next? And Mr. Marcos said, I declared martial law to save democracy. But by saving democracy, he killed it. That was the beginning of a long detention period of seven years and seven months. In the beginning, it wasn't too bad. Like, every day we could visit for one hour. He was no longer in control of his life. And one man was deciding everything for us. And in the beginning, we were both, well, maybe you could say we were complaining. Why is this happening to us? Okay, we're not saints, but definitely we're not the big sinners that other people are. And yet, they're free to do their own thing, and here we are, having to suffer this. And I often ask myself, eh, bakit ka pa nagpapakahirap dito? In 73, a high official of the government asked me, Endorse mo na lamang ang New Society ni Noy. Ayos na. Ilalabas na kita. When I refused, they advised me, sumulat ka na lang kay Marcos. Ask for his forgiveness. O yun na naman ka akong kasalanan. Kung ay siya nagkasala sa bayan, bakit akong hihingi ng tawad? I want to prove to Mr. Marcos that not only comfort and material things are the demands of the flesh, that there is an indomitable spirit that will be willing to take any sacrifices for our people. What was going on in Inoy's mind and heart was something not easily visible or felt by those who didn't know him. But I could, in fact, um, sense the tremendous change not only going on in his mind and heart, but also in mine. One of the greatest problems of a prisoner is loneliness. For seven years, I was not allowed to see the moon and the stars. 
There were days where they left me all alone by myself. I had no reading material. I had nothing. I was twiddling my thumb. I would walk and walk and walk across my room. Just a room of about four meters by five meters. Hoping that I'll get tired. And then when I get tired, I will fall asleep. Knowing that tomorrow will be the same. It was a learning process for him. Living, learning to live in solitude. And just being shut away from what the world was when he was such an extrovert. Eh, kang ganun, be practical. Eh, talagang ganun eh. Makibagay ka na ikaw. Napakalakas ka ng bagyo eh. Ikaw lahi ka mahihirapan diyan. Mag-isa ka dyan. Hindi bali kang ganun. Kung ayaw mo nang sumulat, eh, tumawag ka na lang sa telepono. Ibulong mo na lamang. Ayos na. I would like to tell you, that I was tempted in my 7,000, almost 7,285 days in prison to do just that. I am only human. Ako po isang tao lamang. When my wife and children would visit me and they would leave me at dusk after one hour, I also would like to enjoy the embrace of my children and the peace of my home. During his incarceration, where Nino had spent the most time with his children, because before that he was just so busy, and he would come home late at night or maybe leave early in the morning. And the only time we had together with the children would be Sunday when we, because I made that a rule. But he felt a little guilty now when he had all the time, well, when he was free, he could not take them out. And here they were coming. And said, oh, you know, anyway, uh, they're happy to be with you. And, I think it was February 23 of 1973 when we were told by the authorities in Fort Bonifacio that our visits to Nino had been suspended. They brought me to a mountain hideout in the Sierra Madre and placed me in a box. I had only my brief and my t-shirt. I refused to eat because I thought they were poisoning me. There was nothing in the room, barely nothing. And I had nothing to do but twiddle my thumb. And for the first time in my life, I heard the ticking of every second and I was counting every second into minutes. And as the minutes marched into hours and the hours into days and days into weeks, I knew what loneliness meant. It is April 8th um, or April 7th. The Supreme Court came out with this decision appealing to the authorities in Fort Bonifacio to allow Nena Diokna and me to visit our husbands. Colonel Ramas, who became General uh, Ramas then. Uh, and he said, yes, uh, we will take you to where they are. We couldn't tell anybody. Um, before leaving um, Makati, I passed by my parents' house. And I said, I told my father that um, makakabisita yata kami kanyo, know, pero hindi pa sinasabi kung saan. Then I told my younger sister, Pasi, I said, Pasi, um, can you give me a tranquilizer? Dahil hindi ko alam kung sa kami dadalin eh. I said, oh, it then she gave me a tranquilizer, which I thought was similar to mine. So we went, and um, when we got to Fort Magsaysay, the lieutenant uh, who accompanied us, Lieutenant Bueno, he was telling us that the Diocles will go first, and then after 30 minutes, uh, the Aquinos will go. So, nauna nga yung mga Diocno, and when they were coming out, nagulat kami dahil umiiyak yung mga daughters ni Nena. And we were surprised because alam naman na hindi naman iyakin yung mga Diokno. No? And so, um, my daughters were asking the Diokno girls, uh, why what happened? And you will know, sinabi na lang ganun. So, when we uh, were ushered in, it was like um, a trapezoid. And so, uh, of chicken wire. Then there was another maybe two feet or three feet apart. So we were told to stand there, then Inoy came. And he was standing also behind this chicken wire fence. And I could hardly recognize him because he had lost so much weight and he kept holding onto his pants. Um, later on, I found out that he had lost so much weight, he had to hold onto his pants because they had taken away his belt and 
He had no eyeglasses. They, they had taken that away from him also. And what really, oh, really made me feel so bad was when he saw us, he started to sob. It was the first time I saw Ninoy cry. And he said, um, akala ko hindi ko na kayo makikita. And I want to tell you, my friends, until you have tasted this loneliness, you will not know what solitary confinement means. When he was sobbing like that, my three older daughters, Ibolsi, Pinky, and Vel, started crying also. Then he said, um, I don't know if this will be the last time I'll see you. And then I remember Bolsi said, no, Dad, don't worry, our luck is changing. I had never seen Ninoy, but I, ready to give up and really so, but I'm so help, helpless, which he never was before. And I was saying, then Ninoy, basta magdasal na lang tayo. Then he thought of, a ganito na lang, every eight o'clock at night, um, you pray the rosary and also pray the rosary. So at that time, at least we know that we are praying for each other. So I said, oh, okay, maganda nga yun. What was very surprising, and this is what Ninoy later on wrote in his diary, that he felt so ashamed and embarrassed that there he was sobbing, and I was not crying at all. Of course, I didn't tell him until much later, Ninoy, Binigyan ako ng tranquilizer na pala doble nung dating kiro. Kanya talagang, parang ang tapang-tapang ko talaga. No tears, nothing. And I'm glad that at least at that time, parang one of us was still able to talk. Maybe it took, I would say, almost a year and a half or close to two when we finally accepted the fact that, um, yes, um, maybe we have not sinned or have not been as terrible as other people, but let us think of Jesus Christ, who certainly did no wrong, and yet he had to suffer and die for our sins. I knew early on, and I discovered that there is a God who is just. Na merong isang Panginoon na ibibigay sa atin ang ating kagandahang ginawa at paparusahin tayo sa ating kamaliang nagawa rin. It is because of that faith in my divine creator that sustained me all these years. All I had to do was call for a telephone that was outside my room. All I had to do was pick it up and tell Mr. Marcos, Brad, tapos na, ayos na, I'm throwing the towel. If Ninoy had gone through maybe just a short time in detention, he would not have become the person that he became. Before martial law, I believe in God. I, uh, I mumbled the prayers like any other Catholic in the Philippines. But it was skin deep. You know, more or less superstition, you know. But uh, when I was brought to Laur, where I had my real great uh, spiritual crisis in Laur, I started from the beginning and I disowned God. In Inoy's case, I think it really grew roots and um, he really learned from that very difficult experience, but the, the best thing that happened to both of us that we really became that much closer to the Lord and that we believed that whatever happens, the best thing to do is to just entrust yourself and all your problems to the Lord. So you should not lose faith. You know, this will all come. Magtanim ka at anihin mo. Gumawa ka ng mabuti, iyo rin. Gumawa ka ng masama, iyo rin. And the Lord said, uh, you know, vengeance is not yours but mine. In His own sweet time, aabuti niyo. That's why, to me, the greatest book that I've discovered here in my imprisonment is the book of Job. Yes. I keep on reading and reading the book of Job because I feel that uh, this is where the Lord ta taught mankind how to take adverse and vicissitudes. Diyan ka masusubok. And uh, it's really very enlightening. And yet, you know, kung hindi ka mabibilang ko, hindi mo ma-appreciate eh. You know, you'll never really appreciate it. I've read the Bible when I was out, but I really never appreciated it until I got in. And for which reason, I'm, I'm happy na <laughs> nangyari na ito. Nangyari total, nangyari na eh. Pero I think I'm a better human being now. I can look at, uh, at problems more objectively.
I was constantly getting reports from Manila. Reports talk about possible assassination plots. One report said they won't let me land in Manila. I was so worried, kinabahan ako, so I prayed. The ground personnel of the airlines gave me and my passport a long and suspicious look. Nako, ito na, sabi ko, dali na ako. Nakahinga ako talaga when they gave me a boarding pass and sent me away. Cory, wala tayong chance dito. This is martial law. And uh, only one man makes the laws. They wanted me to fix deep in my mind that this is a no-win situation. Many witnesses were paid before me. I never saw them in my life. And yet they were pointing fingers at me, accusing me of crimes I never committed. They admitted to crimes. They said they were communists. They said they were number three in the communist hierarchy. And yet the government set them free, and I was in jail. Senator Tanyada told me, Alam mo, Cory, dahil ayaw mag-participate ni Ninoy, he can be sentenced right then and there, and there's nothing we can do. Because if he does not want to participate, then that means he's not going to object to whatever. I went on a hunger strike as a protest to what they did to me in the military commission. But more than a symbolic protest, I must admit I had a death wish. I wanted to die. He was saying, you know, if I go, then my suffering will end, and that is my prayer. But if I don't go, then that means Jesus wants me to do something more. And I said, well, think of it that way, because I really didn't want him to have a death wish. So this is what happened for 40 days and 40 nights. I know what it is to go on hunger strike. On the 10th day, my friend, your stomach, your stomach will actually be only a handful. I know what it means. The hunger pains that you go on the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth day. I know the crumbs in the stomach. I know when your hands start trembling and you feel cold because the fat in your body is wasting away. On his 30th day, Cardinal Sin came, administered the last sacrament to Ninoy. It was a very moving thing. And at a certain point, uh, Ninoy's tears were just flowing. And it was later on, I asked Ninoy how he felt. And he said, he really felt so good. He felt that he had made peace with the Lord and that he was prepared to go. And I said, no, don't, don't think of it that way. And so I went on until I lost about 40 pounds. From 163, I dropped to about 127. And then I was rushed to the hospital. My mother cried and my wife naturally, my children, but I was determined. I felt that uh, I've served the full life and it was time to go. But somehow on the 40th day, I was struck by that letter of Father De La Costa to me. And he said, do you think by trying to die you are being courageous? He said, you're not being courageous, you're a coward. It is more courageous to go on living. You're opting out. You're escaping. And it's an act of cowardice. To continue living and to continue fighting. He said, it's more courageous. And Ultimately, he said, if you believe in the divine will, do not interfere with his will. Let his will be done. When I arrived in Taipei, I switched to my Marshal Bonifacio passport. Alam naman ninyo, Marshal was for martial law, at saka yung Bonifacio para sa Fort Bonifacio kung saan ako nakulong. Except for the Taiwan visa and the fake Manila departure stamp, all the passport pages were clean. Kinwestiyon ako. I told him, walang direct flight to Taipei, kaya dumuan pa ako sa Hong Kong. I must have convinced him enough for him to let me go. 
Now, if he says that he wants to come back here, sure, by all means, he can come back. But for what? He has to face up to the facts of life. I will go back because I think I'm innocent. And uh, if Mr. Marcus would like to shoot me on that basis, so be it. Benigno S. Aquino, Jr. This commission sentences each one of you to suffer the penalty of death by firing squad. You can end the man, you can imprison his body, but you cannot imprison his soul. And as long as man will refuse to be defeated, you are never defeated. And so Mr. Marcos can imprison my, my body, but my spirit shall soar. He was going to continue arguing against the dictatorship and that uh, he hoped that he would be able to influence others, especially the people, to do the same thing. That's why I think he ran for the Batasan in 1978, even if the odds were against him. He wanted to have the opportunity to again talk before the people. Unfortunately, he was only given one television interview in 1978 on Face the Nation. All I asked Mr. Marcos is, send... It was one of his most memorable uh, interviews, and I understand that um, at that time, most Filipinos were just glued to their television sets, and the streets were rather empty because people were, were watching you know, on television. So I told him that, and many others told him that. So if only for that one television interview, he felt he had already uh, decided right in running for the Batasan. I heard none of the noise barrage from my cell in Fort Bonifacio. But Cory told me it spread like wild sabi nila, your votes may not be counted, but your noise will be heard. Natakot tuloy si Marcos, so he had to make sure KBL would win by a landslide. Part of the plan was to gather members of the foreign press to join me in this last leg of my journey. They would serve as a foil, para na rin bodyguards, and the presence might just deter any evil plot. At kung may mangyaring masama sa akin, they would let the whole world know. You have to be very ready with your hand camera because this action can become very fast. In a matter of about three, four minutes, it could be all over, you know. And <laughs> I may not be able to talk to you again after this. Now, uh, I am taking some precaution. I'm, I have my, my bulletproof vest, uh, hoping that that would be some kind of a protection. But if they hit me in the head, that, there's nothing we can do there. I can only be protected from here to here. You see, uh, this, is the, this is the latest uh, bulletproof vest that I will be wearing. You know, this Kevlar on top here to protect this and then a back part on this side. But as I said, uh, this is only good for the body, but in the head, uh, there's nothing else we can do. So, I... Uh... He is uh, not imp that important. Uh, it's only the Western press that is making him important. I don't know why. But I knew that somehow I will regain my freedom. Maybe not in this world, but elsewhere, and I knew that sometime, somewhere, Mr. Marcos and I will meet. And in that meeting, I will have my satisfaction. When the members of the foreign press have left my room, I felt the exhaustion. I was just so tired, so drained. If Marcos would take me back to my prison cell as soon as my plane lands in Manila, I would not even mind so I can rest, even for a while. Then on March 19 of 1980, every day they brought me out to exercise. As I was walking around my little corral, all of a sudden I developed a chest pain. On May 5, 1980, almost midnight, they took me from my cell and they brought me to the heart center. That was a Monday. The doctors at the heart center met me, took preliminary tests, and they told me, Senator, they said, 
tomorrow we will begin the battery of tests. And so I slept, but I could not sleep. That was the first time I was brought out of my cell in almost seven years and seven months. And there were beautiful nurses, and the first time I was seeing women in seven years and seven months. And naturally, I was watching my heart as it was palpitating. <laughs> and so I woke up at six o'clock that following morning on a Tuesday, and they brought me down for my x-ray, and they brought me back. And there were these beautiful nurses around, and they say, Oh, Senator, you are like that. You are still there. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I used to be very big. But as I sat down after that x-ray, I was just about to sip my coffee. All of a sudden, I, get, I got hit again by a terrible chest pain that was almost choking me, and my arm was getting paralyzed. So I told the nurse, I said, Miss, please bring me to bed. So they brought me to bed, and they put all of those gadgets. And all of a sudden, the needles were squiggling, and they called the doctor. The doctor looked at the tracings, and then after one hour, they came back to me and said, Mr. Senator, we are canceling all, all tests. The truth is, I did not want them to touch me in Manila. And so I wrote my letter to Mr. Marcos and made two covenants. That if I leave, I shall return. And two, that while in America, I shall not speak out against his regime. And I also said, I will only bring three of my children with me. That's also true. But of course, the other two were already abroad. <laughs> All of a sudden, on Thursday morning, May 8, my wife visited me early in the morning, and she told me, the hospital is crawling with Metrocom cars. Guards all over the place. Baka ka may magbibisita sa'yo. Opo, tignan niyo ako sa Amerika. Sabi niya, there's a plane leaving at 6 o'clock. You can be in that plane. Ay, kako, thank you. And finally, at 2.30 in the afternoon, they brought me out of my room from the hospital, brought me to my house in a van. I never saw Manila, therefore. They gave me 30 minutes in my house to pack, to take a shower, put me back on the van, bring me to the airport, put me in a 747, and out of the Philippines. On that Monday, May 12, they gave me an arteriogram. At 1 o'clock that day, my Filipino doctor, cardiologist, Dr. Rolando Solis, came and said, Senator, he said, I'm sorry, but you have to undergo a triple bypass. And so I finished my operation, and I was recuperating. And I cabled Mr. Marcos after my operation. I told him, operation has been successful. However, I developed a pericarditis. My doctors advised me four more weeks of convalescence. However, if you feel I should now return to my cell, I shall immediately take the first plane to go back to my cell. A week later, the international press came out with the story. Mr. Marcos extends indefinitely the stay of Aquino in America. On the basis of that report, I wired Harvard University and I said, I am now ready to accept the fellowship that you offered me. And Harvard University extended the invitation again to become a fellow at the Center for International Affairs. And that's the story. So when we were in California for a month for his recuperation, every night and every day, Filipinos would be coming around. And I was telling you, know, can't you just forget about this for a while? And, you know, this is the first time that we're able to have some kind of normalcy in our lives. Let's, you know, just enjoy this. And, but of course, I guess once out of jail, he is again boss and he has to be just doing his thing and talking to all of these people. But when I was convalescing, and I was receiving hundreds, thousands of letters from all over the world, America and the Philippines. Filipinos sending me $5 and $10 to help me in my hospitalization. Sending me little money, token of money for my fellowship in Harvard. There was one underlying note in all of these letters. We waited for you for eight years. Will you now abandon us? That's why I really like Boston. During the first year, he was just so happy there. And uh, in fact, he used to tell so many of our friends, oh, this is paradise. And I never dreamed I could go to Harvard. I refer to those as the three happiest years of my married life. He was also helping in the house. And he did a lot of driving. It was really delightful that uh, finally we could say anything that we wanted and that uh, we were having a very peaceful life. He wanted to be where the action was. He was uh, determined to return 
but not to lead any, you know, any fight against Marcos, any, anything engaged in bloody uh, matters. But he wanted just to have a chance to talk to Marcos and hopefully to convince him that now is the time to return to democracy. And so I told my wife, much as we have found our peace and our freedom, I will have to return to combat. I woke up at 4 a.m. and said my prayers. Then I phoned Cory. She read to me some passages from the Bible. I spoke to my children one by one. I couldn't hold back my tears. Then I wrote a letter for all of them. Dear Cory, in a few hours, I shall be embarking on an uncertain fate which may well be the end of a long struggle. I slept well last night for the first time since I left Boston. Maybe because I'm just plain tired, or maybe I'm just really at peace with myself at last. All the things I've told you may be said in one line. I love you. You stood by me in my most trying moments, and there were times I was very hard on you. Early on, I knew I wasn't meant to make money, so I won't be able to leave anything to the children. I did what I did best, which is public service, and I hope our people will understand in time my sacrifices. I realize I've been both stingy with my praise and appreciation for all your efforts, but though unsaid, you know that as far as I'm concerned, you are the best. That's why we have lasted this long. If all goes well, I should be back in my cell before sundown. I'll try to call you tonight if the authorities will allow me. Otherwise, just remember me in your dreams. If I die, then I die, and there's only one to suffer. So long as you will continue the struggle and carry the torch, then I think we'll have a better Philippines rather than have one carrying the torch, we'll have many.
we should not depend on one man. We should depend on all of us. All of us are expendable in the cause for freedom. And therefore, I say, stand up now and be a leader. And when all of us are leaders, we will expedite the cause of freedom.